Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church. It's good to be with you here in God's house where we can take these moments to gather around God's word and have the Holy Spirit increase our faith through his word and then join in our praises together as we praise our King and our Father in heaven. For those of you I haven't met, my name is Nick Schmaller. I'm uh, currently a professor at Martin Luther College in New Ulm. It's my privilege to lead you in worship here this morning. Today is Palm Sunday, and so this is the start of Holy Week as we remember all that our Savior endured on our behalf, that because of what our sins deserved, Jesus in his great love took upon his shoulders the weight of our sins, and he paid the punishment that rightly should have been ours so that we would not face that punishment. But today we get a preview of what always should have been, the way that Jesus truly should have been treated as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Today we see the people praise him for what he truly is and what he truly deserves. And that really will be the focus of our worship here today, that we join ourselves in raising our voices in praise and proclamation of who Jesus is and what he's done. Throughout the service, when we're singing our hymns and join in these songs together, we'll have opportunities to, to wave our own palm branches and try to recreate in our own small way the lauding and the praising that Jesus had received on that first Palm Sunday. And so for our opening hymn, as we sing our opening hymn, please note that there will be an interlude before the final verse, verse 3, where we can stand and throughout the psalm or throughout the hymn, we can uh, wave our palm branches ourselves in adoration of our King. May God bless your worship. Thank you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. My heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the King. You are the most excellent of men. Gird your sword on your side, you mighty one. 
Clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. Let us confess our sin to the King of all, trusting in his tender mercy. Lord, you deserve our glad cries of Hosanna and palm branches waving high. We confess that so often our praise is muted sounds and actions of disinterest. Instead of exalting your name, we have profaned it. Instead of glorifying you, we have dishonored you. Instead of boldly speaking your truth, we have given way to fear. Instead of imitating your love for us, we limit our love for you and for others. Lord, our sins brought you to the cross. Forgive us because of your redeeming love. Our king proclaims, there is no condemnation for you who are in Christ Jesus. No shame to cripple your life, no guilt to press you down, no lingering sorrow and tears, no merit or worthiness of your own, no further work to do. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Now live in joyful obedience of thanks to God in the fruit of the Spirit. Further, show your gratitude by freely forgiving others, just as God has freely forgiven you. Amen. You may be seated for the singing of our psalm. Our psalm will be introduced by the cantors. They will sing the opening refrain and all the following verses. The congregation is asked to join in the following refrains after they introduce the first one. and King of glory be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. 
We praise you, O God, for the great acts of love by which you have redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. As he was acclaimed by those who scattered their garments and branches of palms in his path, so may we always hail him as our King and follow him with perfect confidence, who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Our first reading for this Sunday is from the Old Testament prophet Zechariah. Verses from chapter 9. At times, Zechariah has been called the prophet of Holy Week because there are so many prophecies that he had made about the events that would happen in this week that led up to Jesus' crucifixion. And here we'll listen to the familiar words that predicted what the events of Palm Sunday, that Jesus would ride in on a colt, the foal of the donkey, into the capital city of Jerusalem, and he would come to bring peace. That God said that when Jesus, this king, came they would get rid of the chariots and break the battle bows because he would proclaim peace to the nations, the peace of forgiveness that means that sinful people are now right and reconciled with their holy God. Let's read these words from Zechariah chapter 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. The word of the Lord. Second reading for this Sunday is from the book of Hebrews, the first verses from chapter 12. In the previous chapter, which is sometimes called the Heroes of Faith chapter, God demonstrates how throughout the history of God's people that he had made promises to them that had strengthened them and kept them faithful through the struggles of their life. And now the writer of the Hebrews points us to fix our eyes on Jesus who endured his own sufferings and struggles of his own, and yet did not scorn the cross, but willingly went to it, so that you can have faith that is founded on what Jesus has done, and the peace that only he can bring. We read these words from Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The word of the Lord. Be Please stand as we join in singing our a gospel acclamation, and we can wave our palm branches as well as we sing this song.
The gospel for this Sunday is from the Gospel of Mark, verses from chapter 11. This will serve as the basis for the sermon this morning as we read the account of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Please note that when the crowd joins in their praises of Jesus, the congregation is asked to say those words along with me. We read. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The good news of the Lord. Praise be to you, o Christ. We'll join together in singing our next hymn. Please remain standing as you are able. Please note that for verse three, uh, 2, the men will sing just the verse. All will join in the refrain. And for verse 4, the women will sing the verse. Again, all joining in the refrain. And we can wave our branches as we sing as well.
You may be seated. Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and our victorious King, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There's a, a Latin proverb that goes like this. Civis pacem parabellum, which translated means, if you want peace, prepare for war. If you want peace, prepare for war. Really, the idea behind this proverb is that peace can only be accomplished through a show of strength. This really was the motto of the Roman Empire for many years, hundreds of years even, is that just from the show of their strength, the force of their mighty legions that they never really put out a commission but always had ready and standing guard, when they showed such power, they actually were able to accomplish quite a bit of peace in their empire. If you want peace, prepare for war. Sometimes we might be tempted to try and act like that too, don't we? That we can convince ourselves that no matter what the world throws at us, that we can meet it head on. Sometimes that is maybe true, that through the abilities and capabilities that God has given us, when there's a challenge or work or some sort of trouble in our homes, that we can fix these problems without much effort, much effort. But there are other times when really we just try to convince ourselves that everything is going to be okay and try to live by that Latin proverb. If we just fake it enough, convince ourselves that we have everything in control, everything will be just fine. Doesn't always work that way, though. But do you know what's even more impressive, even more astounding than having so much strength that there is peace in your land? What's even more impressive is that you are so in control of everything that there's no show of force needed at all. Consider this story from the Old Testament. King David was reaching the end of his life. And as was the case in much of David's family, there was some trouble within his family. This time not Absalom, but it's Adonijah, one of David's sons that is looking to usurp the throne for himself. But David, and more importantly the Lord, had other plans. Solomon would be the next king. And there had been so much that had been done by the Lord that had led up to this day of the coronation of Solomon. So much instruction for David and David's people, the Israelites, through the inspired word of God. Of course, we can't think about David's life without thinking about his fall into sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. But God had used the prophet Nathan to bring him back to repentance and proclaim the message of forgiveness. And God had instructed David about exactly what he should do as he was preparing to hand over his throne now to his son. And God wanted to demonstrate that he was so in control of everything that even if Adonijah was looking to start a rebellion, that God was in control. And so what did they do? Well, God told David to go and tell Nathan the prophet and the high priest Zadok to go and fetch a mule. That Solomon was going to be coronated not as this king of power, decked in armor, riding in a war steed or riding in a chariot, but he would ride on a beast of burden, a mule, without any of that fancy attire. And because it was the Lord who told them to do this, there was the appropriate amount of fanfare that went with it, trumpets that were blaring and shouts from the people, long live King Solomon, that was so loud it says in scripture that the voice or that the ground even shook. And so then when Zadok the priest, when he took the horn of oil and he poured it over the head of Solomon and it dripped down his head and onto the ground, the flutes played, the people shouted, and they knew that this king would be different than his father David. David, the great king that he was, he was a king of war, that battles and fighting was part of his reign throughout the whole course of history, but for Solomon... He would have all the power of his father David and even more wealth. But he would be different riding in on this mule without any of the armor or weapons because he would be a king of peace. 
thousand years later, another son of David stood outside the city of David, the, the capital city that David made the capital of Israel, Jerusalem. And just as so much had led into the coronation of that day when Solomon was named the next king, so much had taken place that led to this day. There was so much instruction that was done by Jesus to his disciples and all the crowds that had surrounded him, telling him exactly what would have to happen for this king to bring peace. There were messages of repentance and the forgiveness of sins that only Jesus can bring. And then when he was walking into Jerusalem, the question was, how would this king approach this city? How would he show himself to his people, the people that he came to bring peace to? Would it be with his full display of power and might, this time now in front of all of his enemies that were looking to kill him, the same kind of power that Jesus had displayed outside Lazarus' tomb as just a few days earlier he had raised him from the dead? No, not for this king. He would come on a lowly animal just as Solomon did without any army marching behind him or any war garments on his own body to demonstrate that he was so in control of it all that there was no need to show force whatsoever. And how did he demonstrate this to his people? Well, Scripture tells us that before he even marched into Jerusalem, when they were still a couple miles away, he said to his disciples, I want you to go into the city, and I want you to look for a colt that is tied there. And when you untie it, someone just might ask, what are you doing untying this colt? Just tell them the Lord needs it, and they'll let you go. And what happened? Exactly what Jesus said. That once more, he's demonstrating to his disciples that he knows everything. He is completely in control. The colt right where he said, the people saying just what he expected and that nonsensical response, well, the Lord needs it. When they said, fine, bring it back whenever you're done. And so now riding on this beast of burden, not a, a steed that was fit for war, no chariot, no army behind him, finally on Palm Sunday, the people recognized who Jesus truly was. And want to honor him as this king that he truly was. They, they took their cloaks and they put it on that donkey to make some sort of saddle for him. The others, they laid their coats on the road and others cut down palm branches and waved them in the air and laid them in the streets, finally hailing him as the king that he truly was. And the shouts that they said that day, so, so much better than long live King Solomon, where they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. And as they shouted this, they must have known what they were saying. When that word Hosanna is said in, in Hebrew or Aramaic, probably what they were speaking on that day, it, it sounds like this, Hosanna. And as they said that word Hosanna, they must have realized that they were saying the very name of Jesus, that very same word, Yeshua, the name of Jesus in Aramaic, is in the word Hosanna. And so as they say, Lord, save us, Hosanna, they are saying the name of Jesus as he enters into that city. And you can imagine the sound. And if the ground shook on the day that Solomon was coronated, think about that whole city, the city of Jerusalem, now filled with people as they're getting ready to celebrate the Passover and all the shouts of saying, Lord, save us, and saying Jesus' name, the only one who saves. What do you do after an entrance like that? What do you expect Jesus should have done after hearing the praises of the people finally getting what Jesus rightfully deserved? What should Jesus do after such an entrance? And here's what Mark says he did. It says he entered Jerusalem, went to the temple courts, and looked around at everything. And then since it was late, went back to Bethany to rest. Doesn't seem like much, does it? Until you think about what Jesus was looking at and who was doing the looking. This is the same one who saw that colt miles away, tied up in the city streets, and knew exactly what the people would say when his disciples went to untie it. 
And so as he went into Jerusalem and looked at the temple, what do you think he saw? He saw those courts where in just a couple days he would drive out the, the money changers and the sellers that were in the market because this was a house of prayer, right? This is what the city of Jerusalem was all about, what the Lord would accomplish. Just over there, he would see the house of Caiaphas, the high priest at the time, where in just a few days he would be falsely accused and his closest disciple would deny even knowing him. There the, the temple is the place where Pilate held court, where he would be interrogated by Pilate. And three times Pilate would say to the people, there is absolutely nothing wrong that this man has done. <clears throat> Next to that, the barracks, where the soldiers stayed. The same soldiers who would mock Jesus, spit at him, beat him, and nail him to the tree. Jesus went to the temple courts, looked around at everything. And he didn't back away. The one who knows all things, sees all things, saw exactly what was going to unveil before him on that day. And because he is a king, a king who wants to bring peace to his people, he did what a king should do. He did not back away from that struggle and the suffering that was before him. Because he so desperately loves his people. This didn't all start on Palm Sunday after all, did it? I mean, it's for this very reason that Jesus had entered into this world of sin because he saw what his people needed and he had to act. From the time Adam and Eve had fallen into sin, he saw the needs of his people, that there was now enmity between the perfect God himself and the people that he longed to be with. And so he came to conquer those enemies no matter what that fight might look like. And yet on this day, he wanted his disciples and all the people to know that it was not because the enemies would win that he would endure all these things. No, he had everything under control. It was because of his great love that he endured those things that were to come. Jesus, Yeshua, the, the one who saves, he's also the one who sees it all and knows it all and is in control of it all. And in even a greater way now, because Jesus is no longer in his state of humiliation where he set aside for a time his full power and glory that he has as true God, but now exalted on high at the right hand of God, he rules and sees all things. And as the king of peace who only wants to give peace to his people, what does he see as he looks at you today? <clears throat> what is it that you're struggling with in this world? No matter what it is, Jesus sees it. And since it's his name, he wants to save and help you with it. Is there a temptation that just continues to come and knock at your heart's door? And the devil tries to convince you that you'll never be free from it. It'll always plague you throughout your life. Jesus, Yeshua, the one who saves, he also sees that. And he longs to help you through it. And he wants you to know that he is able to do immeasurably more than all you ask or imagine. The devil is not more powerful than he. Are you struggling with some sort of guilt? A past mistake in your life that continues to come into your minds and make you feel low and unloved? Jesus, Yeshua, the one who saves, he sees it. And he longs for you to hear his promises. As far as the east is from the west, that is how far Jesus has removed your sin and guilt from you. You are forgiven. You're at peace with God. <clears throat> are you struggling with your vocation right now, whatever it might be. At work, it maybe seems that nobody notices the efforts that you put in. Things aren't going as you as planned, and you start to forget what it even all is all for. Well, Jesus, Yeshua, the one who saves, he sees that too. And he reminds you that really everything that we set our hands to in this life, it all is really just for an audience of one anyway, to give thanks and honor to the God who has given himself for our salvation. And he tells you he sees it. He sees it all. And he appreciates it. And he loves it. Even what might seem large or small in our eyes, 
because it's done in honor and thanks to him. Is there someone in your life who doesn't know about the king of peace? Someone in your family or a friend, and you're just wondering, how will I ever get a chance to talk about what it is that gives true peace? Jesus, Yeshua, the, the one who saves, he sees it, and he continues to equip and help you. In fact, he reminds you that all you have to do is just say his name, because in his name it says what he has done, and all the hope and peace that he brings. You know, the devil and the Pharisees that saw the events of Palm Sunday, they would have longed for the people to be silent on that day. After all, the other gospel writers tell us the Pharisees said this, just that to Jesus. Make them quiet. Don't let them say this anymore. And Jesus said, well, even the rocks would proclaim my name if they were to stay silent. That Jesus, the one who saves, the one who sees all of our struggles, all he longs for us is to proclaim his name and praise his name, which he fully and rightly deserves because of how he has sacrificed himself as our king of peace to bring you salvation. And the people before Jesus' time, as they heard the prophet Zechariah and they saw the coronation of King David, they longed to say this name and proclaim what he would do. The people that followed Jesus on Palm Sunday, they were doing that same thing. And we who are gathered here today through the power of the Spirit are saying the same thing, who Jesus is and what he has done. And so what Jesus asks us to do now is just to join in those praises of Palm Sunday. To say who Jesus is. To say what he has accomplished. And after all, scripture tells us that on the last day, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That one day, we are all going to be doing it anyway. And so let's join in those praises here today. Because he is worthy of it. Because he has accomplished your salvation. You know, Palm Sunday is really a simple day. Don't get me wrong, there was a lot going on. And the praises that Jesus offered, the prophecies he fulfilled, man, it all speaks to who Jesus truly is. But at the heart of Palm Sunday, the people were doing what they always should have done. They were finally recognizing Jesus as the king he truly was. And they were doing what their king wanted him to do. They were praising his name. And so today, on this Palm Sunday, let's join in that chorus. That not just with the words for the, the rest of this day throughout our service, as we sing our psalms and hymns to God, we join in that same refrain of Palm Sunday, but in every task that you set your mind to today, we do it with our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and protector of our faith, the king of peace who has accomplished true peace reconciled sinful mankind with a holy God and the one who truly deserves all our praise and thanks. It may be a simple task, but it is not meaningless. It's what he deserves. It's what he's worthy of. And it's what will fill our days with eterni for eternity without any end to our joy in doing it. And so let's join in that already today. We praise his name. After all, it's Jesus, the one who saves, the only one who saves. And so we join together to praise him as he truly deserves. In his name, amen. Now may this peace of God which transcends all understanding, may it guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stay now as we join to praise the name of our triune God as we join in singing our confession of faith.
You may be seated for our responsive prayer of the church. O God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you with thanksgiving and joy. In your great mercy, you sent your one and only Son to share our humanity and to unveil the mystery of your saving will from all eternity. Through your holy word and sacraments, let us see the earnest work of your salvation in every word and deed of Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, you have redeemed us from our empty ways, not with gold or silver, but with your holy precious blood and your innocent suffering and death. All things were made by you, yet you humbled yourself and became our servant. In you shines the light of life, yet you became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Enlighten our darkened hearts and minds that we may ever marvel at your willingness to die for those who did not live for you. O Holy Spirit, giver of life, grant to your church strength of purpose in your holy service that we may seek with willing hearts the building of your eternal kingdom. Put the song of salvation on our lips and close us, clothe us with the garments of praise that we may declare. You wept, dear Jesus, over the city of Jerusalem when you desired to gather her children together as a hen gathers her chicks, but they were not willing. Give us tender and compassionate hearts, O Lord, for those who reject your word or do not know you. Lead us to be faithful and patient ambassadors of your saving work and loving care, and grant success to the preaching of repentance and forgiveness of sins in your name. Keep in your tender care, O Lord, all those enduring affliction during this holy week, the sick and the sad, the discouraged and the disheartened, those who are troubled and those who are being tested, those who are confined at home and those facing death. Let them see in your passion, death, and resurrection the forgiveness of their sins and the promise of eternal life. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Now, as we have received your mercy and seen your glory in the face of Jesus Christ, Grant to us, O God, the comfort of your grace through him who died but rose again and evermore reigns as king in heaven and on earth. Amen. We now gather our offerings of thanks to the Lord. If you haven't done so yet, you can fill out one of those blue connection cards and place that in the offering baskets as well.
Please stand as you are able as we join in a version of the Lord's Prayer put to song. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, you sent your Son to earth to offer full and complete payment for the sins of the world. As he entered Jerusalem to the shouts of Hosanna, so also hear our prayers and save us by your mercy. Bless the preaching of your word, and in our words and actions, graciously grant us the opportunity to proclaim our triumphant King, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please remain standing as you are able for our final hymn as we wave our palm branches and sing our praises to our King.
You may be seated. Good morning again. Good to be with you here in God's house and for us to, to join together and praise our King for all he has done to bring peace to his people. I have just a, a few announcements I was asked to give. A couple are weather-related with the impending forecast of snow. Uh, they, I saw posters for the Lenten Vespers concert at Martin Luther College in New Ulm. It was originally scheduled for this evening. They postponed it to Tuesday at 7.30. have a couple musicians coming from Mankato here. We wanted to make sure that they could get there safely. So Tuesday at 7.30, if you're intending to attend that Lenten Vespers concert, it is also streamed online and will be archived there so that you can view it later as well. Um, also today here at St. Paul's, there was a, um, there's a women's book club on Mama Bear Apologetics that's looking to reschedule that for another uh, date as well. And then finally, have a, a letter from Pastor Doberstein, who is holding the call uh, here to St. Paul's. Dear family and friends of St. Paul's, God's grace and peace to you as you enter a holy week with a palm of praise. Thank you for your patience and prayers these past few weeks as I wrestled with the privilege of potential ministry with you. In short, at this moment in God's kingdom, I must continue his work where I am at and therefore must humbly decline the call you gave. I don't know how or when God will reveal his plan for a pastor for you. But in your waiting is this. We wait in hope for the Lord, Psalm 30, verse 20. It might seem as if you've been waiting a long time for a pastor. You haven't. You've been waiting for the Lord as the head of the church because the strength and the hope and the power of the church is the crucified and risen Jesus Christ. Let your hearts rejoice in him. Trust his time. Put your hope in his will. He is coming soon. God bless your holy walk with him this week, Pastor Don Doberstein. And so Pastor Nelson had also shared with me plans on uh, April 7th, I think, to discuss next plans uh, for the vacancy here that continues at St. Paul's. You know, you're in my prayers regularly as you continue your vacancy. Those were all the announcements that I've uh, been given. God's blessings to you on this coming week. Oh, Pastor Nelson has one as well. <laughs> but come on over, it's really good to hear them share their, their confirmation verse and, uh, and share the faith that they have. So, uh, God be with you all. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for adding that. Yeah, God's blessings, uh, I won't see you during Holy Week, but God's blessings at those festival services as we remember what Jesus has done.